needed a guitar. I had to impress the girls. Uh, <laughs> I was playing Peter, Paul, and Mary. My next door neighbor comes home with a drum set. Uh, so I made a guitar because I didn't know anything about amps and I could buy an amp and maybe make a guitar. Well, that's a lot to do with the music. We were all inspired by the music of the era and, um, and that, that was an exciting time for a lot of reasons. At about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I would run at the backstage doors of the Berkeley Community Theater with two guitar cases in my hand and the doors had opened. There were definite, you know, steps along the way. I, I was interested in, in Peter, Paul, and Mary and that kind of, Bob Dylan. And, and then, of course, growing up in Berkeley, the, the whole music scene there, I was hanging out at uh, Campbell Coe's music shop, which was a little garage backed up against People's Park. I miss Bob Taylor at the American Dream in San Diego by probably a few months. I, I was offered a spot in the corner of the cooperative there, which turned into eventually Taylor Guitars. It was called the American Dream. Captain Bob ran it. And uh, it was just a cooperative of guys in an oversized garage and different little rooms here and there building their own guitars with cooperative tools that they all shared and uh, then I came home <laughs> did it by myself so I uh, <laughs> I was taking my very first guitars to shows in the Bay Area and uh, just crashing getting there early helping set up finally getting asked by um, one of the Bill Graham guys uh, uh, what are you doing here? And I described, I just said, hey, I want feedback for the instruments I'm building. And he set it up, this was Clayton Johnson, he worked for Bill Graham, and uh, he set it up so I could get into a show every weekend. And I did. And it got to the point where Bill Graham actually, I was always at the end of the line when he introduced, the band was introduced and he went, who are you anyway? And. Uh, so I was getting a chance to get feedback from all these fabulous musicians. And uh, when I first met Michael, of course, my interest was in steel string guitars. And, and uh, he was classical. And I said, well, do you think it would work on steel string guitars? And he actually said, no, I don't know. Of course, I, <laughs> I wasn't listening. And uh, interestingly enough, Richard's and my ideas, though coming from similar source, Kasha, uh, became over the decades more and more similar in design. Not that we were in each other's shops at all, we were working independently with the same concepts, but that the structure and uh, the basic structure of the instrument, whether it's steel strings or nylon strings, is the same. You just have to compensate for the difference. Um, so, yeah, Richard and I, we chased each other's tails around a lot. He was, he was an irascible old fart. Man, and I loved him to death. Uh, yeah, he, he thought out of the box. I met Richard through Michael Kasha. Uh, I first saw Richard's early prototypes of Michael's ideas um, in, uh, at Berkeley, my grandfather being a, a Joel Hildebrand at chemist at Cal. And uh, he was, Cal, Kasha was a visiting professor at the time, and I was just building my first acoustic guitar. And I was a, just excited by the fact that somebody with half a brain had stuck a mirror inside the guitar and, th and thought it just shouldn't be like that. And um, I've never built uh, any, a traditional guitar. I've never built a dreadnought. In fact, I rebuilt a dreadnought that a friend had dropped on his kitchen floor. Um, had to take the back off, took the bridge off, put a caution bridge on it, rebraced it, put it all back together. We thought it all sounded pretty good. Luther 
three in uh, this part of the world has been uh, an astounding renaissance. The, the people involved are so talented, um, from Rick Turner and Tom Rebecca and, and uh, of course, late Richard Schneider. Um, it, such a rich area that uh, Blue 3 supply places have grown up around this area of LMI, Todd Taggart and Allied. And, um, they've all been very influential in the uh, uh, development of, of what was the Healdsburg Guitar Festival. And just look around NAMM show, the quality of even small manufacturers' work is phenomenal. My involvement in the show was primarily to do what I've always done, which is try to show the world that there's actually another way to make and look at the making of guitars. Everybody else is making traditional instruments. I have really much more interest in trying to push the evolution of it forward. So that's been my, uh, my main focus. That's what we as luthiers have to offer. The, you know, the factories make the guitars for the masses, but why, you know, if you can't compete with them monetarily, why try? Um, we, get, we have to be the cutting edge. They have to come to us, otherwise, and, and we are also the go-betweens with the musicians. And we've got to realize that the world's a changing place. Uh, I, I've actually, <laughs> I have a new neck design that I'm working on that uses remnants from Gibson's production. Uh, it's stuff that's too small um, and uh, too short for their needs. Perfectly good wood. They can't use it because of their demands for the giant headstock and that always breaks off. Um, so uh, we're going to have to start thinking about using the best materials in the most efficient way as possible. I'm not blind, I'm not deaf, I, I don't do this in a vacuum. You have to get feedback. I wanted to get feedback from somebody who wasn't going to just look at the guitar and go, what is this thing? It's not a normal guitar. So I went to Doc Watson. I had three guitars, all exactly like that model, different woods. First thing, I, I set it down in his lap and he runs his hands over and he says, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so I, I, he'd already seen it, and, uh, but he couldn't see the woods. That is a redwood top, about seven grain lines per inch. It's fence material. It's got walnut back and sides, walnut and maple neck, um, rosewood bridge, ebony board. He liked that guitar. This is Mr. Rosewood, Gallagher Rosewood man. He liked that guitar. So again, you know, my curiosity is peaked. I'm going, what's really going on? What do we hear? She had that to B below middle C. I didn't even think the guitar was going to make any sound at all. Basically, the guitar is a terrible instrument. It's a tuned acoustical chamber with a set, a couple of frequencies it likes, and the rest it does begrudgingly. It just, you know, um, that's why it's all uneven. And it's too small to work in this range, and it's too big to work in this range.
fundamental difference is the coupler to the top. It's an impedance matching system. The regular square bridge is a bandpass filter. What the bass string is trying to drive the top to do, and what the treble string is trying to drive the top, top to do, is completely different. It's trying to drive a much bigger wave pattern here, and this is all broken up. Although it's doing it all over the top at the same time. So this, this is basically the coupler to the top. Then inside, you're trying to support the top. First of all, this is the stupidest place to put a sound hole. You've taken a perfectly good piece of wood with the grain running through it and cut it right in the wrong spot and makes the guitar want to collapse. So Martin put in its X brace thinking they were going to make it strong. They take two perfectly good pieces of wood, they put a notch in them and they ruin both of them. Um, <laughs> I've got other things about that. Uh, there's there's a flying brace, which I think you can probably have seen, that is touching the top, right in this area. And then the wings fly down and buttress onto the sides. So that I haven't added all that structural mass to the top, yet I've supported that area. So the top is still free to really move. Then it's got longer base bars, of course, and... Uh, Short treble bars. The neck block is also reinforced with carbon fiber. There's carbon fiber skins on poplar cores. You can see the brace on the back. You can actually see the weave of the carbon in there. ideas for the new harp guitar design that is going to change the frequency response level in it. And all harp guitars are going to go through a big change. Um, yeah, the popularity is, is really such that it's, it's ready for an upgrade. Everybody's got the latest computer and they want a harp guitar that was made in the 20s and 30s. you got to be joking. But, you know, these kids are playing you know, Hotel California, right, on a harp guitar. He needs a cutaway at least. So, um, but, uh, you know, other ways of making the instrument easier to manufacture is really my focus. And the whole system I've got designed for making the instrument uh, revolves around this heart pin. So I could, I'll be able to make necks here. They can make boxes down there. Once we get it tweaked, they can even glue the bridge on and mm -hmm. everything's going to align. That is the biggest problem with harp guitars and why the necks are never aligned with the cloud up there. They're always a little cockeyed and sometimes there's a little metal piece and because they're trying to set the dovetail and there's so many different angles there, they just it's impossible to get consistent. As with all of my stuff, it's a bolt-on neck. And it's finally a harp guitar. It's fan fingerboard, so I finally... It's a single saddle for all the strings, rather than these, you know, things that look like they're two different bridges glued on, cockeyed. Eco-friendly. Then the black veneers here, I'm going to put in carbon fiber. So by the time it has a slight conical shape to it, it'll be super strong. I'm going to put lights in here, little LEDs, and so it'll, when it's up the pitch, it'll turn on. It'll be a tuning system within the headstock built into the tuners. This stump is actually my chia pet. I haven't watered the lichen in a while. See, it pops right back up.
a tribute to Michael, Les Paul, and um, oh, Steve Miller, uh, and of course, great advertising for EMG and their cool new pickup system. <laughs> I had leftover parts from building the parts for Michael's <laughs> instrument. And, and then, oh, yeah, stuff gets carried away. I even uh, forged Michael's signature back here. He brought a godliness to his music. Is the, is the joke of uh, um, this guitar player dies and, and goes to heaven and, and uh, he's shown in and, and uh, this is his room and the first night happens and, and he could swear that Michael Hedges is next door playing and if this goes on and on he finally he asks St. Peter is that Michael next door? He says, no, it's God. He only thinks he's Michael. Um, Obviously, I still miss Michael, too. But <clears throat> Michael lives on uh, in the harp world. That he's, he's spawned this phenomenal uh, group of talented, crazy kids. We've got to pass this on, otherwise, you know, we're like the Shakers. Uh, this, the young talent that's out there now is phenomenal. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm now going to sponsor two kids, one of whom used to teach uh, in my music store, uh, and another who I think one, bought one of his first guitars in my music store. Uh, yeah, i got to get the kids out there. Um, uh, Julian Lang, I want to get him on board. Uh, I curated a show here at the museum, uh, Guitars as Art show, many years ago, and had musicians come and play. He, uh, he was 13 at the time and played for me, so, yeah, absolutely. Another Jedi warrior I want on my team. Synchronicity, to me, is very real, but I know that it doesn't happen unless you're in the stream. And uh, right now, I guess I'm in the stream because I, I'm not efforting, and things seem to be happening. Uh, Thank you.